Welcome to Truth Telling with Elizabeth Dialto, the podcast dedicated to focusing on the truth that's always evolving within us and around us, where we explore the potentiality of truth as a highly esteemed value, especially in the context of everything that falls under the topics of healing, growth, leadership, and creativity. If you're new to me, full expression is my jam. I'm the creator of a practice called Wild Soul Movement, My flagship year-long online women's circle is called Power. I run virtual new moon circles every month, weekend workshops all over the planet throughout the year, and I work with clients one-on-one. I also started doing stand-up comedy for fun in 2018. So this is a place where you can come with your multiple talents and passions to be encouraged, nourished, and cultivated. There's a lot of noise and ignorance in our current culture, and the show also aims to cut through that by exploring the truths of a diverse range of incredible voices. From authors, artists, creatives, and educators, to activists, speakers, and those in various scientific and esoteric fields, our guests hail from cultures and countries all over the world. The main intention here is to contribute to creating a kinder, gentler, more curious, collaborative, reverent world where people respect each other's backgrounds, experiences, and truths, and they trust in themselves and in life and recognize that we need each other. We post a new interview every Monday, and if you want to keep up with the show notes and quotes from our guests, you can follow me on Instagram at Elizabeth Tialto. A few disclaimers. No episode of the show is meant for everyone, and every episode is meant for whoever needs it on the right day at the right time. Not all guest views will reflect my own, and that's intentional. We don't learn, grow, heal, or improve by staying in our comfortable bubbles with all of our people who look, think, or live exactly how we do. If you love what you hear and find it useful and inspiring, the best way to show your appreciation is to share the episode, subscribe to the show, and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen in from. Thank you so much for being here, and here we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 308 of Truth Telling with Elizabeth D'Alto. I am your host, Elizabeth D'Alto, and today we have a biz chat. This is what I call episodes where we dive a bit deeper into business-related, entrepreneur, leadership, creative-specific things. So this one might not be for everyone. However, If you don't have some kind of leadership role in your career, if you don't run a business, if you're not a creative or some kind of innovator, there still might be some gems for you in here. So maybe listen until you feel like you hit a point where you know for sure it's not for you because you never know what might be lurking in this conversation. (laughs) I don't know. I I don't know if I can call a solo episode a conversation, but um, you know what I mean. So let's dive in. First, some context, as always. Uh, I'm really big on context. It's important to lay some groundwork in an episode like this. A few weeks back, I asked in my Instagram stories what I should jam on this month, in the month of May 2019, in the solo episode. And a surprising number of questions were about business. So that's why this is a biz chat this month. Um, And actually, After that occurred, I realized it was pretty synchronistic because the summer is upon us here in the Northern Hemisphere, and I'm doing the business immersion that I did last summer again. In fact, I I may do this every summer. I don't know. Every I think it'll be one of those things where every year as the summer approaches, I'll go, am I going to do it this year? Okay, I will or I won't. So this year I decided I'm definitely doing it. And listen, I resisted doing business coaching or mentoring for many years, Because first of all, I find a lot of business coaches to be pretty douchey. And what do I mean by douchey? I mean that they don't, they care about money more than they care about people. I mean that they're just using tactics and strategies without necessarily honoring um, that people are so unique and so different uh, and that certain things might not align for folks. Uh, As well, they might shame people who don't want to use their cookie cutter strategies And when people don't get results, they blame it on the person rather than taking responsibility for that. Of course, their approach can't possibly work for everybody. So that's what I mean by douchey. I'm not into that. And then the second thing is I've worked with a number of business coaches over the years, and I've had really up and down experiences with them myself. So as I considered doing this, 
it felt like a huge responsibility I didn't necessarily want to take on. But when enough people ask you for something, you begin to listen and accept that maybe you have something of value to offer. And what I realized is that where my value lies is in helping folks find what works for them that can be aligned and sustainable. And so this isn't necessarily going to resonate for folks who want to be like internet famous or mega influencers with like hundreds of thousands or millions of followers or people who want to be like multi-billionaires and are really attached to that like seven-figure business label. This isn't really this isn't really about that stuff. Uh, with the people who resonate with my teachings and guidance and mentorship around business things, what we share are some qualities of worldviews, integrity and ethics. Uh, we care about humanity and the collective more than we care about the profits, but we are not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Money does matter, just not in such an egoic way. It's more in a generous way. Something I like to say a lot is the more we have, the more we can share and contribute. And, you know, obviously there tends to be a spiritual, mental, emotional, energetic, metaphysical, what am I going to want to call this? You know, the image that's coming to mind is in the story of Ariadne and the Minotaur. There's, depending on who tells the story or where you read it, it's a golden thread or it's a red thread. So these shared values and beliefs and desires for what we contribute to the world is kind of like the golden thread through everything that I teach. You know, that's really what determines whether people are going to resonate and align with what I have to say or not. You know, we care about generosity. We care about full expression of the soul, how we can optimize and fulfill our potential, and ultimately how we can live like my favorite Irma Bombeck quote, which if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard me say this tons of times. When I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope I have no talent left and can say I used everything you gave me. I read that so many years ago, and it was like the seed was planted inside of me. I think it like woke something up in me that was like, that's it. That's the jam. That's the real goal underneath everything. And I wrote this in an Instagram post the other day. When you're here to do what you're here to do, it's okay to stretch yourself. In my experience, when you're working in alignment, when you are connected to your purpose or a mission or some kind of sacred work that you're here to do in the world or message that you know that you're here to deliver, um, you will feel stretched and you will feel uncomfortable quite a lot. You'll just get really good at navigating it. It won't be able to knock you out, burn you out, get you off center, um, or really overtake or overwhelm your life in ways that it once did. And of course, there's transitional periods to that. Um, but listen, you do not have to stretch to the point of self-sacrifice. You just have to find the point where purpose can meet what I call cultivated resiliency that honors your values, priorities, and personhood. As well, curate a strategy that works for you to engage with the tools available in ways that make you feel like more of yourself, not like you have to be somebody else. And like the number one tool that I'm referring to here is for sure social media. And this kind of approach will require a lot of courage and confidence because in a lot of ways you will be paving your own path. And for a lot of people, um, the confidence and the courage needs careful cultivating. Um, even though our worthiness is inherent and innate, for a lot of people it's been programmed out of you. So reconnecting with that is a huge underlying thread that also binds much of what I'll talk about today here together. And as well as I was going back and reviewing the curriculum of my summer business immersion from last year and kind of just journaling about it and riffing on anything that I wanted to add, anything I wanted to subtract from last year or how I could elevate the experience for participants this summer, a term that I had never used before came out, and that is integrous visibility. 
how can we put ourselves out in the world in a way that is an integrity with who we are and how we're built, but also with our brothers and sisters and people of humanity, where we are doing our best to do more good than harm, understand that people have all kinds of different lived experiences, that our way might not resonate for everybody, and that it's important to be considerate, really considerate of that. And, you know, to be clear, I'm no branding expert, but what I am great at is surrender, trust, embodiment, finding and using your voice, creative expression, embracing your power and truth, and leading with love, kindness, and compassion. Uh, I also really, you've probably heard me say this before on the podcast as well, I am about mastering your craft more so than mastering sales and marketing. Because this is another one of the big disparities I see, especially in online businesses. There are so many people who are so good at sales and marketing, and they are really not that great at the service that they are delivering. And this leaves a lot of folks really jaded, uh, feeling like they wasted money or that they were taken advantage of. And a lot of people will then project those experiences onto folks who really are quite gifted in their craft, who really will provide a much higher service and give so much more value and have better experiences and containers. And so that's a bummer, you know, and I've experienced that. I've had some real jaded folks come at me with stuff that just wasn't me, but they were bringing it from past experiences. So I'll get into that later in the episode. And and really... Everything I'm going to talk about here, I dubbed several years ago as spiritual special ops, and I love that. So the other thing to just give you, how do I want to describe this? I don't know. Take it however you want to take it. Just so you know where I'm at, uh, my business has been grossing in the anywhere from 200000 to – $320,000 range for the last like four years. So in that multiple six-figure range, <laughs> I hate these silly terms, and my profitability has run the gamut, but what I have built allows me to take a lot of time off, um, which I really had to do in 2017 and 2018 to do some serious inventory of my life and my relationships and some healing I really needed to do. And one of the things also, because of the type of business I run that factors into the profitability profitability, um, is a lot of my lifestyle, a lot of my travel, a lot of my day-to-day is actually can be written off in my business because it it, it contributes contributes to the work. So um, again, that may or may not be something that some of you, that, that works for you or that's possible for you. So I'm just letting you know where I'm at so that you can personally determine, um, you know, (laughs) whether or not you want to listen to what I'm saying here. You know, take in what resonates for you, ditch what doesn't. Um, I share that stuff up front. So if you want to like (laughs) prejudge what I'm about to say, now you have the data on which to do so. But ultimately, this biz chat is about creating and growing a business that can sustain a life you actually want to live, not bind you or get you stuck in a life that you don't necessarily want to be in. So before we dive in, the last kind of point for context I want to give you is to remind you that we're all unique and amazing in our own ways. I'm personally built to do things my own way. And just because I'm not into others' methods or practices doesn't mean that we have to bash what other people do. I'm not really here for that kind of energy. We're all different. What works for some people won't work for others. And I used to have so much judgment for things that weren't in alignment for me, and I just don't anymore. I don't have the energy for it. What I have the energy for is discernment, you know, to put my care, attention, and energy towards what does align for me. And so the only thing I ever truly take issue with is is and are manipulative practices 
or folks who communicate in a way that is just so tone deaf when it comes to privilege, access, sustainability, and other people's lived experiences. So for example, um, Trudy LeBron, who's a former podcast guest, will put a link to her episode in the show notes. The show notes for this episode, by the way, um, I'll probably give you a good bit of resources in this episode and a couple links to a couple of things. So the show notes for this episode will be at untameyourself.com forward slash 308 if you if you want to go get the links and the resources. But I was talking to Trudy LeBron this past weekend because she was at my Wild Soul Movement weekend workshop in New York City. And we were talking about something that she heard on a popular digital marketing podcast that said something along the lines of that the best way to measure your impact is your bank account. And I couldn't disagree with this more. Um, And Trudy and I were on the same page about this because if you're someone who's service-oriented, a leader, artist, creative, entrepreneur, and you understand impact or are curious about impact on a deeper, more inclusive, meaningful, and holistic level, you know that some people are going to have more access to more resources. Some people might be really shitty people, but they make a ton of money. You know, money is not How much you have in the bank is not a measure of your virtue. It's not a measure of your worthiness. Some people will say that it is. Energetically, are there factors that contribute to your receptivity? Sure. But there is so much more to that. So if you're out there talking about impact and thinking you're making an impact and you're only basing that on the volume of sales you have, your approach is lacking you. So I'm going to walk you through in this episode some of my own experiences, evolution, things that I've learned. I'll answer some questions that people submitted via my Instagram stories and also tell you about the summer business immersion in case you're interested in that. And even if you're not, I am going to encourage you to pay attention to how I talk about it and describe it because that in itself is a lesson in making aligned invitations rather than trying to hard sell folks into something that they might not need. Because let me give you a little insight here, which you may already know. I'm not assuming anyone knows or doesn't know anything I'm sharing here. I don't want people in my programs and my experiences who don't want to be there. Energetically, that does something to the container. It's a disservice to me. It's a disservice to the person. And it's a disservice, if it's a group, to the whole rest of the group. So again... Some folks who are out there just measuring things by volume of sales are really missing out, in my opinion and experience, on cultivating much better experiences for folks by being a bit more discerning about who makes it into the container rather than just having the only qualification being who can pay. So let's dive in. I'm going to answer the questions I received first. So this question, the first question was, what's worthy of a head turn in life and business? And this question, it's funny, actually came from a friend of mine. I can't remember if it was the same day or the day before that we were actually out. We were at the Whole Foods in Playa Vista and we were walking up to it and there was just this man who was so stunning. We both kind of like stopped in our tracks and we were like, damn, like it was full head turn moment. And so uh, that's where that's where the basis for this question came from. So for me in life and business, what is worthy of a head turn is always like the the loudest word that comes up for me is alignment. Things that are aligned with my integrity, my values, my priorities, what I'm here to do in the world, who I am and how I'm built, the things that I care about most deeply in my heart and on a soul level which for me, those things typically point back to full expression, compassion, love, generosity, and collective liberation. These are the things that I care about most. So those will be the things for me that turn my head. And then in a broader way of answering that question, because as those of you who listen regularly know, embodiment is a big part of my work and also a big part of my life and my personal practice. So things that register for me as truth right? Things that give me the chills or those tears of truth or or hit me in all the other ways that my body registers truth 
those things are always going to turn my head and get my attention because I've learned over the years to really trust and really pay attention to those things. Someone asked how to embrace your own way and decisions. The answer here is that this is a constant practice, right? Because depending on what's going on in your life, you may or may not have the courage and confidence in any given moment to do this. And it takes a lot of trial and error and experimentation. It takes a certain level of comfort with risk. I've always been super comfortable with risk. And part of that comes down to something I'll talk about a little bit later, which is uh, how I perceive mistakes and failure. I don't really see anything as a mistake or as a failure, even if it doesn't go well, because there's always something to learn. Like there's always some data or information there for you to take and incorporate into future choices and things like that. So uh, truly to embrace your own way and decisions, the things that you really need to get good at are surrender and trust. And, And for me personally, these things include prayer, meditation, contemplation, embodiment practices, being able to have an open line of communication with the divine and you know you might relate to the divine as god or the universe or some other name infinite intelligence you know whatever anything i always share here put it in the context of your own language and your own belief system but for me it's like whatever it's that animating creative force of the universe having an open line of communication with that and you know the prayer that i say constantly is use me move me and make me a force for expansion for love for good and for healing so if that's my practice and if that's my focus i'm available to be moved i'm paying attention to signs and symbols and synchronicities and conversations and invitations i'm cultivating my discernment to say yes to things that feel good and right to me and to say no to things that don't and to pause on things that just aren't clear in any given moment And so all of these things contribute to that practice of embracing my own way and decisions. Someone asked about dealing with haters, naysayers, or other energy-draining shenanigans, as well as people who steal your material. So here's the deal. I, I kind of love how Brene Brown talks about this in Daring Greatly. She talks about, you know, people who aren't in the arena don't get to say thing like don't like their opinion doesn't matter is the bottom line it just doesn't matter right so if someone's going to be a hater or a naysayer which by the way let's be clear about this none of us are for everybody right and just because someone disagrees with you or doesn't like the way you do things it doesn't mean they're a hater right a hater is actually someone who is being hateful so someone who's being nasty or judgmental or mean um, and making like character attacks against you, right? Like talking about what you're doing or how you do it or your behavior, that's not actually a character attack. And no one is required to agree with us or be down with our methods. So that's not a hater. That's more of like a dissenter. And to be honest, like that's fine. I personally don't take it in because, you know, unless someone is coming to me with feedback of that I've caused or created harm or offended them in some way that is real, right? Because some people will take offense to things that are not, that's that's not actually what it is. They're just making it mean that. Um, But then some people will take offense to something that was legitimately offensive. So um, there is some discernment here and some nuance and complexity to what is a hater and what is a naysayer. Um, so when someone is a true hater or a naysayer, I just don't I don't take it in. I don't have time for that. I don't have time. I don't have energy for that. Um, I just don't engage with it anymore. And I used to, right? When I was a lot more attached to these things or in my ego about these things or unresolved within myself about certain things, I was much more easily triggered. Now it's much easier for me to like delete someone or just ignore a comment and just live and let people live. You know, I just don't, I don't really care is the answer. Um, and as far as people stealing your material, something I've discovered over the years is that not everyone is built to be a creator. Not everyone's built to create their own stuff for whatever reason. And so for some folks, the root of ripping off other people's stuff is going to be the route they choose to take. Now, there are some people who truly are just, they don't know what they don't know. And they don't realize that it's not cool to plagiarize or it's not cool 
to take someone else's framework and then just like interpret it yourself and not give credit. So there really are just some people who don't know what they don't know. Uh, that explains it. It doesn't excuse it. And then there are just some people who are friggin' lazy um, or just so insecure they think that they have to take someone else's stuff because they don't think they're good enough or whatever. And so, again, this kind of thing, unless someone is like infringing on any of my trademarks, um, ah, you know, my the way I feel about it is good luck being me. You know, everything I do is an expression of who I am and how I'm built, which is something you're going to hear me say a lot in this episode. It is in alignment with what I perceive the divine desires through me. And so ripping off of my stuff is not what the divine desires through anyone else. So it's just not a long-term sustainable strategy, which is why I say good luck. Like eventually someone's going to have to face themselves, you know? Um, and I really truly believe that like there's more than enough for all of us to go around, more than enough abundance, more than enough resources, more than enough ideas, creativity, um, space in the marketplace. And so as well, I just don't really give this a lot of time, energy, or attention. Uh, making the leap to solely work for yourself. If it was a leap, how did you do that? This was not really a leap for me. Um, ever since I had my first job as an independent contractor, sales rep for Cutco Knives at the age of 19, I really essentially worked for myself. I made my own schedule. I got my own customers. I got my own referrals. And even when I went through the management training program, I was running my own office. A lot of it was very self-sustaining, self-reliant, self-resourcing. So um, this wasn't a leap for me because, in fact, I'm really not built to work for other people. Even in the ways that I did, so when I was a personal trainer and I worked in some different gyms, um, still I made my own schedule. I created my own classes. I taught my own things. Uh, but there was like a company that I worked for and I sometimes had to comply with like what they wanted or what they didn't want. Um, and then I did spend one year actually working in corporate America. Like that shit was not for me. So it was more of a leap for me, to be honest, in 2007 when I left when I closed my Cutco office in the Washington, D.C. area and decided to work in corporate America, I was just burned out. And I was like, I don't want to be the one in charge. I don't want to be the boss. I'm going to go work for somebody else. That was more of a leap for me. <laughs> so I'm not the best person to ask this question, though. Here is something that I, I do want to say, because I've seen it a lot over the years, and that is if you are someone who is not really comfortable with risk or uncertainty, I do not recommend taking the leap to being self-employed or running your own business unless you have like a really good financial cushion or some kind of fallback plan uh, because it's really hard to be like creative and focused if you're having like stress or worry, especially about money. Because money contributes to basic human needs, right? Food, shelter, things like that. If you're not sure how you're going to pay your bills, you can bet your ass that you're not going to be showing up in like your full, high quality, best expressed, you know, service or creativity. So uh, that's part of the energy management of it. Like just, I don't think there's any shame in keeping a part-time job or staying in a position that pays your bills while you figure out what you're going to do so that when you're ready to take the leap, you know, you already have something that's kind of built. Again, that's if you're someone who's not built to be with uncertainty and risk. Um, for me, I'm, I've always been pretty comfortable with those things. There were times in my life when it was more stressful than others, but especially since creating Wild Soul Movement and really deepening my own practice and mastery of surrender and trust and receptivity and allowing and these things that I teach. Um, I, haven't, I haven't worried about money in years, even during times when money has been tight. I just always know there's more where that came from. And so it doesn't necessarily impact my creativity or my expression or my day-to-day. -day. Uh, but that's not the case for everyone. So that's what I have to say about that. Someone asked, if you were to start your business over, where would you start in 2019 to build a following? So my answer to that, first of all, I have to be super honest that um, 
things are so different now than when I started. When I started my business almost a decade ago, all these platforms were different. Facebook was different. Instagram was different. It wasn't so oriented around algorithms and paid advertising and things like that yet. So uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like it was easier to build a following in those places. And as well, the marketplaces were not as saturated. Like there's so many friggin' coaches and healers and helpers and people doing similar things now than when I first started. That is not to say that people shouldn't be starting businesses or there's no room for you. But I will say what I would focus on is Instagram and email, and I would focus more on engagement and interaction with people. Um, And, you know, I'll add in a third thing, even though I don't do free groups anymore and I haven't for a couple of years, but I really was able to build a lot and engage with and build my audience and loyalty and build that no like, and trust factor through free Facebook groups from, I think I started my first one in 2013, fall of 2013. That's when I started the first one. Um, and I had two different ones. And at the time when I closed it, was it 2016 or 2017? I think it was 2017. It had 5,000. It was 2017, August 2017. Uh, had 5,000 people in it at that point. And energetically, I just I couldn't hold that space for people anymore for free because I was doing a larger mentorship that year. I was doing teacher training. I was just I was holding so much space for so many people in paid programs. I just didn't have the space to hold for people in free spaces. And as well, I realized that this podcast is like an invaluable free resource. And so making myself available on social media, in Instagram, in my DMs was a lot more sustainable for me personally, energetically, and mentally and emotionally, to be quite honest, um, where my engagements with people would be one-on-one and not necessarily having to also manage people's engagements and interactions with each other. Um, A lot easier for me. So in Instagram... There's just so many great ways to connect with people. Um, Stories make it so cool. There's so many interactive tools. You can use hashtags and stuff. So I I love Instagram. I love the visual aspect of it. I love that you can write captions and cool stuff like that. And then email. Like I will always have an email list because some people are more on social media. Some people are more in their emails. You know, some people get the emails, some people don't. You know, sometimes things go into spam folders. I like to have a social media point of contact and an email point of contact with folks so that um, one way or another, if I'm sending out a message that someone needs to receive, they'll be able to see it. So that's where I would start. And I would definitely put the focus on engagement And listen, I understand that there could be a lot of comparison uh, because there are so many people with platforms who have a lot of followers and things like that. But uh, it's really about, and this is the deeper ripple effect. This is like the truer, more tangible impact that you're having on folks. Um, when When you see them and you witness them and you engage with them and you can answer your questions and you can establish yourself as a person who has value to offer and is possibly even an expert or an authority in what you do by, you know, what you choose to share and how you choose to interact with people and as well um, to treat people well, you know? Um, I had a friend tell me a couple years ago, they're like, I think your brand is that everyone wants to be your best friend. And I was like, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way. But I have a lot of space for engaging with people. Like, you know, if you're someone who like DMs me on Instagram, I usually respond. And that doesn't burn me out. And it's not, quote, beneath me. And someone sent me a really like judgy message a couple months ago. I think I might have mentioned this in another podcast episode because it was just so hilarious to me that this person was like, oh, you must not be that successful if you're answering your own DMs. And I'm like, or maybe I just like it (laughs) because I like my people and I like connecting with you and that feels important to me. So engagement is everything. Word of mouth is everything. Referrals are everything. You know, when people enjoy their experiences with you um, or the things that you create or the things that you make, uh, the things that you share, they're going to share it with other people. Uh, But they also need some reminding because people are super inundated with information and content these days. So just remind people, have calls to action. So those are the questions. Those are the questions that I'm answering today. Um, 
So here's something else I want to share in terms of building a business that is sustainable in the long term, that is aligned for you. You really need to take some time to get to know yourself, your strengths, your shadows, your gifts, what you're built for, what you're not built for, what you can and can't control, um, discernment in your business, learning how to trust yourself, let go of judgments, attachments, notice where your ego kicks up. What are the things that are draining for you? What are the things that are energizing for you? Um, and also earn your stripes, you know? Like there's a lot of things that I don't have to do in my own business anymore, but I did early on in the beginning. Um, but now I have uh, the ability to pay people to do the things that I'm not good at. However, doing those things myself in the beginning makes it much easier for me to hire and manage people because I know what they entail. So um, running a business is and should be a really humbling experience. Um, there's a huge learning curve in a lot of things. And, you know, some people unfairly are very hard on themselves because it's it's almost like you assume that you should know how to do things that you have no training in, which is pretty ridiculous. Like if you never had to learn, if you have never learned how to do something, how the hell would you expect to be good at it? You know? So you might need some training. You might need some skills. You might need to explore um, and practice stuff before you get really great results or really desirable results. And I understand that there's a lot of people out there who sell folks on getting like very quick and very fast results. And that is possible. But my question is always, is it sustainable? Are you going to burn out? Or what happens when these platforms change? You know, over the years, when Instagram algorithms, when Facebook algorithms, when these things change, that, that shit has not affected my bottom line because I have this podcast, I have my email list, um, I have a, an amazing network of people um, that I've built over the years by going to events and things like that um, and cultivating, you know, real genuine connections and relationships with folks. So those things don't affect my business. And if those things are affecting your business or affecting you energetically, mentally, and emotionally too intensely, that's pointing you towards things that you need to do some work on in yourself and in your business. Something that is also helpful to cultivate is a high level of willingness to be judged, misinterpreted, misunderstood, projected upon. You know, when you're any kind of public figure, any kind of entrepreneur, people are just going to blame you for shit. You know, you might be the person of the day who triggers something in them and then instead of taking responsibility for that, they want to blame you for it and make it about you, you know? And, and sometimes it's valid. Sometimes it's really not though. So, you know, high willingness for that. Uh, ability to not really care what strangers on the internet think of you. You know, I really don't care what that many people think of me. And the people who I do care are people who are actually in my life, you know, who are close to me in some way, who I have some kind of real true connection or relationship to. Um, strangers on the internet, they just don't get, they don't get my attention. They don't get my energy. Um, I do not need to hold or carry things that are not mine to hold or carry. But I've also, and I always am, learning and expanding my awareness and education around what is my responsibility um, on a broader scheme of things in terms of collective liberation, learning what are the things that still fall under. Maybe the things that I don't know, I don't know. Or maybe the things that um, you know I'm still working on and practicing and in some cases, you know, not really getting right or great or perfect yet. Um, but I'm putting in the effort. I'm willing to mess up. I'm willing to take responsibility when I mess up. And that's that. So here's something else I want to share. And this can apply to anyone no matter what you do. Resentment and guilt are important things to navigate if you have a service-based business. Resentment is always a sign that you've overgiven, overfunctioned, overdelivered, um, or overextended yourself at your own expense, right? Like I, I gladly overdeliver fairly often in my business, meaning people get more value out of a thing than what they paid for. Part of that is, is because a lot of the work that I do, the results and the healing and the shifts and the transformations and the change and the growth that people experience, it's intangible stuff. Like even literally just this morning, which you got to love divine timing on things. Just this morning, I got a text message from a client, literally who I worked with four years ago, that said, 
Um, I've been doing the artist's way, and this morning as I wrote and reflected, I thought of you and just how pivotal the work that I did with you has been for me. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you. And she sent me a picture of her and her new partner. One of the things that we worked on many years ago was helping her leave her marriage. And, you know, she shared, remember how I said I felt like I was suffocating in my marriage? This relationship is like taking a deep breath. It's completely different energy, right? So, like, how are you going to put a dollar amount on helping someone get out of an experience that was, like, draining them, that wasn't good for their family, and now they're able to be in a situation that's much better and much more aligned for them? Like, you can't really put a dollar amount on that. So, yeah, that was an over-deliver, but – um, it wasn't an overextension. You know what I mean? I didn't overgive. I didn't overfunction. I just I just did what I do. So, but when you're overgiven, when you've overextended yourself, when you've overfunctioned, often the result is that you will feel resentful. And I've experienced this in my business before when I've undercharged, um, when I've actually overdelivered in the way that was an overextension, where I just I didn't charge enough for something. And I just felt like I was drained. And we'll get to this. I'll I'll talk about this as well as as money, as energy, and the importance of even energetic exchange via pricing and money and stuff like that. So resentment means you've, you've done too much, you've given too much. Guilt is when you feel like or think that you haven't done enough. We feel guilty when we don't think or feel like we have done or given enough. And so a distinction between these two things is that resentment is based on like an actual has already occurred energetic expenditure. Guilt is based on thoughts and feelings about something. So trust is really helpful here. Something that I say a lot that I fully believe, and I don't know where this comes from. If this is a quote from someone um, originally, I'm sorry I'm not attributing it to the proper place if it is. What is for you cannot pass by you. So another thing that is helpful around this resentment and guilt stuff is I don't I don't ever beat myself up about stuff. If I did it, it was correct. I just accept it. It was correct in the sense that it happens and I can't change it. So what can I learn from it and how can I move forward? How can I learn and then hopefully not repeat the thing that didn't work in whatever way? So um, I mentioned this earlier and we're circling back to it now. I don't really believe in mistakes or failures. There are things that didn't go well. (laughs) There are things that didn't go the way I wanted them to. And I, I learn. I just learn, incorporate, dust myself off do better next time, hopefully. Even if I don't do perfect next time, if I could just do better based on what I learned, fantastic. Um, I don't really regret things. Um, Even things that I've invested in that haven't had a great ROI or in some case were total losses, um, there's always a lesson there. I consider all of this, I file all of this under research and development, growing, expanding, changing. Um, It's part of the gig. Sometimes lessons have to be more painful or more expensive than others to actually learn them. And that's another thing that I just accept about life. That's just how it is. So a couple things as well, tangentially related to this. If you're a solopreneur or if you're like a small business or company, don't compare yourself to larger organizations or folks who have budgets for things that you don't yet or folks who were built for things that you aren't, or who have goals and visions that you don't. Like really notice when you're comparing yourself to people who are just not like you in so many freaking ways. This is one of the reasons why I don't really compare myself either. I gave up on comparison because I'm like, there's, it's very rarely is it an apples to apples comparison that we're making. It's more often than not apples to oranges or like Apples to ballpoint pens, not even in the same category. It's not even fruit to fruit. Hopefully that metaphor makes sense to you. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. What I'm saying is it makes no sense. It's not a fair comparison. It's literally just like self-abuse, self-violent to compare yourself to people that are either so different than you are because they have different skill sets, backgrounds, histories, privileges, access, resources in some cases, or to compare yourself to folks who – have so much more help or support or knowledge, awareness, or understanding than you do, just don't do it. 
So now I want to talk about money as energy and energetic exchange. So I mentioned that a couple of years ago, one of the reasons why I closed for good and I won't have another one except for like once a year I do a pop-up one um, towards the end of the year and it's a pop-up. It has a beginning date and it has an ending date. It's not an ongoing thing that I do. Um, this way I can I can muster up and I can cultivate the energy for it and then it ends and I put that energy elsewhere afterwards. Now, when I was doing it year in and year out in an ongoing way, I at first didn't realize how depleting it was until I had built my business to a place where I had a couple of different programs and services and different kinds of clients going and I was running more workshops and intensives and just my energy was really going towards serving the people um, I was serving on a deeper level. So this is why – this is when money becomes – I mean money is always energy, but here's what I mean by like the energetic exchange of money. If people are not paying you to do something and you're doing it for free, where's the energetic exchange? If the energy is just going out but there's not much energy coming back, that's just not going to be sustainable. Like It's like math. It's really just math, energetic math, if you will. Some people will want to criticize that and make it wrong. But the fact of the matter is, look at creating a fully flushed out business model. I have plenty of things that I do for free. This podcast is free, free for you. It's not free for me. It costs me money to produce and create this. It costs me time, energy, attention, finding new guests, having the conversations, all kinds. It costs me all kinds of things, but I get so much out of it. I love doing it. So it's totally worth it for me, right? But it's an enormous free resource for you. You're never going to have to pay for this podcast. That's kind of cool. Um, and as well as social media. You know, people all the time are letting me know, oh my God, that thing, that point, this thing reminded me. That was so helpful. Cool. So there's a lot of things that I put out in the world that nobody pays for that people get a lot out of, okay? So the things that I do require payment for, of course, that service is going to be a deeper service because it's commensurate with what someone's getting in exchange. You know, my group programs, certain things I offer scholarships for. So we can also be making things that are more accessible for people because I understand that not everyone is in uh, the same or similar socioeconomic positions and people have all kinds of things going on. Um, and some people, though, are really resentful that they can't get access to something. Some people I've had also be really resentful that um, I get closer to or build deeper connections with folks who are in my paid programs. Y'all, that is also math. <laughs> that is also by nature, of spending more time with those people, getting to know those people, walking through some of the most intense experiences of their lives with those people and supporting them through it. Like, of course, there's going to be more of a bond. And so one of the things that I learned how to do for myself, mostly through embodiment work and practice in the last several years, is come up with an appropriate price for things where it will be an energetic match to what I'm going to be providing, um, creating for people, or like the level of space that I'm going to be holding for people. Because when we burn out, this goes back to the resentment thing, but it also goes back to physical and energetic health and burnout. One of the reasons why people burn out is because they're just giving way too much and not being fed back. And one of the ways that we're fed back is financially, right? Right so that we can engage in self-care or that we can take a vacation or that we just have the ability to be more generous with people and things in our lives uh, that, that energize us. So for example, why have a business? Why be you know at the helm of your own experience if you're not going to create something that's going to allow you to truly give and serve and show up and contribute and help not only your clients and customers, but like organizations or people that you really care about. Maybe that's like a family member who can't take care of themselves completely, or maybe it's, you know, young people who you want to support as they come up in their own journey and their own experience. Maybe it's an organization or a cause or a specific group of people. Um, 
this is what this is what I mean when I say the more we have, the more we can share, right? We don't live, unfortunately, we still live in a very capitalistic world. We don't necessarily live in a culture where we can completely unplug from capitalism and still be able to live, right? So it's kind of, this is how we strike the balance when you treat money as an energetic exchange, you know? There are some things that I price based on like, what's sufficient? Could I charge more? Hell yeah. Like there are some things that I do that I can charge two or three times as much as I do, but I'm fine. Like I'm good. I am I am provided for, I'm cared for, I have what I need. And so I'm comfortable uh, charging a rate that is more um, sustainable for people, you know? But it still feels energetically like enough for me. It's sufficient. And I love looking at this through the lens of sufficiency, not through the lens of greed or excess. And again, some people are just entirely uncomfortable with their own worth, with the value of a service. Some people just don't understand what the value of a service is. Some people are just not connected with their own worth, right? And so when we talk about value, it's the value of a service. What that value is, the value of the outcome that people get. It's not like the list of things that they get. It's the outcome, right? Like more time does not necessarily equal more value, more results, getting the outcome that someone's want, helping someone hit their goal or meet their dream or fix a problem or give them a solution to something they can't do on their own. Like that's the outcome. That's the result. That's what we're saying. Um, That's what I mean when I say value. But then worth, again, I just want to remind you, like we're all inherently worthy. No one is more worthy than anyone else to receive compensation for something that they're doing in the world. Um, And outside of compensation, also other forms of energy to receive love, support, kindness, generosity, compassion, you know, all of these things. So I hope that makes sense. Um, And some of this might be repetitive. I know I've talked about it in other episodes or other interviews, but if you're hearing it again, take that as a worthwhile and valuable thing for you because perhaps you're in a place to hear it or apply it differently right now because now is always different than before. So a lot of people have ideas about how things should be. And of course, they have every right to ask for and desire what they want. But listen, if it's your business, and again, you're building something that's sustainable and aligned for you, that allows you to serve in your highest capacity and be like in your brilliance, in your gifts, in your best expression, um, just because people might want things from us doesn't mean that we have to adjust, compromise, or bend to meet them. If it falls outside of, again, our values, our priorities, our integrity, our mission, or our purpose, you know, none of us is for everyone. I actually recently, for the first time in many years, had started working with a client. And then after about a month and a half, um, she came to me with a concern and we decided to end the contract. Uh, that I wasn't actually going to be the best fit for her. And I was totally cool with it. She was totally cool with it. I didn't take it personally. And what I did learn from that and what she learned as well is this is this had been someone who had worked with me in a group before. And I kind of assumed that she would know what to expect in working with me one-on-one because she does her own coaching work. She had an expectation that I would be more like she is in her work and how she works with her clients. So there was just, there were some assumptions, there were some misplaced expectations, and we ended up not being a good fit. And and it was cool. We had an amazing conversation. I was super proud of her because she reached out to me. She's like, I need to have a courageous conversation with you. And I'm like, yes, do it. Go for it. You know, you know, if you're a person with boundaries, um, you love it when other people have boundaries, right? You don't take it personally. You're like, hell yeah, because you can honor and respect where other people are. So, you know, we each took responsibility for our part. We parted on great terms. And um, I was able also to really deepen into, you know, again, who I am and how I'm built, who are the best clients for me to work with in certain capacities and who aren't. You know, I personally prefer to create experiences in which people can empower themselves. So for people to take responsibility within the container I'm creating, if I'm carrying someone through, what do they do when the container ends? How do they develop the self-sufficiency to not need me anymore? And that's something that's important to me. It's never been my business model to create dependency and have people who keep needing me and keep re-upping with me. Some folks choose to. Like I have many clients who I've worked with for 
three, four, five years even. And sometimes they'll take pauses. They'll come back when they need something or when a new challenge arises. That happens. But um, if if and when that happens, it's an empowered choice. It's not one that they were ni- manipulated into because there was a dangling carrot or an incomplete promise. That is one of my pet peeves. When part of the way through an experience that someone has already paid for, that they're showing up for, the pitch for the next experience becomes more important than completing the current one. And lots of things are set up that way. Um, I don't set my stuff up that way. Lots of times people ask me uh, with my Wild Soul Movement weekends, I've had some business people ask me, what do you sell people at those weekends? I'm like, I don't. We run the weekends. And then, of course, people know what's available to them if they want to work with me in another capacity at another time. And plenty of folks work with me in other ways and other capacities after they come to certain things. But to me, it feels disrespectful, again, because of the nature of my work, right? At the end of a Wild Soul Movement weekend workshop, often people are feeling really tender, really open, really vulnerable. They've done some really deep work. They've had some incredible realizations. Um, That's not the time for me to ask someone if they want to do something else with me because um, people might not be in a state to say no if they mean no. They might be in a state of feeling like, They do need more when really what they need is to rest. They need to integrate. They need to reflect. They really might not need any more help from me, or they might. But to give people time and space to integrate and then make that choice from an empowered place rather than from like an immediate or a time pressured place, that feels more in line with my integrity. And so that's what I do, you know? Balance what works, what pays the bills, and also what sustains you, right? Handholding and guiding folks is also a balance. You got to figure out how that works for you. Personally, I aim to encourage and cultivate sovereignty, freedom, and self-reliance, not self-sacrifice, self-reliance, confidence, and to help people hone their skills, again, without creating dependency on me. And at this juncture, I've been doing this for so many years, I am comfortable saying that this is an art because you really have to be able to tap into yourself tap in with the person, trust yourself, trust them to know what's best for them, and have the confidence to really allow what wants to unfold to unfold um, and not take it super personally. You also want to be working with people in ways, again, that aligned for you and that sustained. So one of the things that works for me is having a hybrid business model. I cannot do everything online. That's not fun for me. I like to be with people in rooms. I like to meet my people. I like to like get to hug my people in real life. When people come to my weekend workshops, I'm I'm always reminding people, I'm like, hey, if you need a hug, like I'm I got free hugs. If you need a hug before lunch, if you need a hug at the end of the day, like come steal a hug. And often I will have someone come up to me and be like, I'm gonna take that hug. And I'm like, great, that's what I'm here for. You know, we get to be together. I personally need that. That helps me to thrive. Um, and as well, it helps other people as well. I'm not into these big launch models that some people are into. I I prefer to make invitations that feel more intimate and personal to fill my programs. Um, For my power, year-long women's circle, I do more of a launch for that. But again, like everything else, I have figured out how to do that my own way. So I think – let's wrap up. I just want to say something about mission. I'm working on this theory. So don't hold me to these words. Just like take it in, let them roll around in your system and you can let me know if or how it resonates for you if you feel like it. I'm feeling that the spiritual special ops way of doing business and or operating in the world as a leader works through this formula. Values plus priorities plus personal gifts equals mission. When we can get clear on the three things, the mission becomes more clear. Then we can make more aligned choices. And the three things being values, priorities, and personal gifts, like your gifts, your talents, your skills. When we can become clear on those three things, the mission becomes more clear. And then we can make more aligned choices and focus more easily because we don't waste so much time trying to figure out the three things or having to experiment to get to them. So all of that said, that was my riff. That's what I wanted to share So if you're someone who is an entrepreneur, does run a business, if you really resonated with these things um, and you are interested in the summer business immersion, I'm going to tell you about it. And so what I'm going to do actually is 
read you the email that I sent out uh, when I created it last summer. I'll do that first, and then I'll, I'll give you a little more information on it. So here's what I wrote last summer, and all of this still stands. So I said, if you're a business owner or an aspiring business owner who would love to work with me to grow your body of work in a loving, sustainable, and integrous way um, this summer, this is for you. One of the most famous lines from one of my most favorite movies, The Godfather, is, it's not business, it's personal. And it wasn't until I started my own business that I realized I strongly disagree with Michael Corleone, the character who says this line in that movie, in case you haven't seen it. For a lot of us, business is personal, especially if you're the type of person whose message is their life. The two are intertwined. The values and priorities inter inextricably linked. The impacts of each constantly feeding into the other, whether that's positively or negatively. So if you're a person who runs a business and it's personal, the summer business immersion invitation is for you. For the last several years, I've, I mentioned this earlier, stayed away from business coaching because there were a lot of business coaches um, whose practices I don't align for me and I didn't want to be lumped in with them. It also felt like one of those just because I can doesn't mean I should type of things. However, the entire time I resisted it, the number one thing people were reaching out to me for behind the scenes was help with their businesses. Occasionally, I would say yes, and most of the time, I would say no. So in 2017, I was chatting with a close friend about her business, and she interrupted me to ask if she could just hire me. And I sat with it for a moment and then decided yes. Now, I know that not everyone has the time or resources to come to Los Angeles or fly me out and put me up wherever they live to do a deep immersion. So I created a 12-week summer immersion that happens online for those who want to level up their life, their message, their receptivity, their money, their confidence, their leadership, their offerings, their impact, and more. This is really important, though. The thing that put me over the edge and made me decide to do this, in addition to the heart-exploding results my immersion clients get, is that I'm beyond tired of seeing some of the most amazing, caring, talented human beings struggle in business while some of the crappiest people out there air quote, kill it. So who I really want to help is those who want to grow their businesses according to how they're built and what they're passionate about, while also not sacrificing or compromising their values and priorities. In other words, no cookie cutters, gurus, or bullshit. I can't with all the same, same, light washed, white washed, surface level noise and nonsense. There's too much of it out there already, and it's time to cut the crap. We need more genuine people ready to fulfill their potential and make a real difference. So if that resonates for you, you can apply for the summer business immersion. The application is at wildsoulmovement.com forward slash biz2019. That is wildsoulmovement.com forward slash B as in boy, I as in incredible, Z as in zebra, 2019. There's no sales page for this because I'm not here to sell you on it. If it's for you, you will feel it in your heart, your body will pull you, or your mind will keep thinking about it, and you'll fill out the application before the deadline, which is June 8th. The coming about of this has already been divinely orchestrated, and I know that the filling of it will be as well. So if you're interested in this business-specific experience, these are the details. And by the way, these are the 2019 details. I updated this. We start June 11th with a kickoff call, and we wrap up on September 5th. After the kickoff, there are 12 Zoom video calls that happen weekly on Thursdays starting June 13th. We will skip Thursday. That's the 4th of July here in the U.S., you can call in from a computer or a mobile device and do not have to be on camera if you don't want to. You also do not have to attend live to get the most out of the calls or the experience. I've had many women over the years participate in my programs from all over the world who can't attend live calls, get the same or even better results than those who can. And this is because everything is recorded. You receive the recordings within 24 hours and you can also pre-submit your questions. Now, I'm open to having non-women identifying folks in the business immersion, but something I will really need to see is that you're someone who can be in a space um, without necessarily centering yourself, um, explaining things to other people, assuming other people are dumb, or just like really some of the things that folks 
do sometimes when they're used to when they occupy a lot of dominant groups. And so if if you're someone who is not a woman identifying person but can be in a group environment where you don't try to like take it over or feel super entitled, then certainly you're welcome to apply. Um, and listen, <laughs> if you self-identify as those things, you're probably not listening to this podcast anyway, but I just need to put it out there because the safety of the container is very, very important to me. Uh, so there's two different levels that you can join. Level one is group only, and level two includes a one-on-one call with me each month. So three one-on-one calls, one in June, one in July, and one in August. Um, during one-on-one calls, if you choose that option, we dive in even deeper and more specifically into what you want help with in your business. So um, the women who did the one-on-one last summer, the things that I helped them with uh, were largely around nitty-gritty things in their business. So for some of them, it was their offerings. For some of them, it was strategy around launching programs or social media. For some of them, it was around paring down, deciding where to put their time, energy, and attention in their businesses to really get the most out of the time that they have. A lot of them were moms. So it was about like budgeting their life and their time and their energy and stuff like that. And last summer, I kept the group small. It was only 14 women. This year, I'm going to make it even smaller and the maximum number of people I'm going to work with this summer is going to be 10. And so um, it's first come, first serve. So again, if you're feeling compelled, if you want to apply, apply sooner than later. The deadline is June 8th, but today, if you're listening in real time, is Monday, Mar- uh, Monday May 27th. Apply soon. Again, you can apply at wildsomemovement.com forward slash biz2019. That's B I Z. 2019. And listen, this is another thing I'm tired of. I'm tired of people charging so many thousands of dollars to folks who aren't six or seven figure earners yet, who can't necessarily afford it, who don't necessarily have the budget for it. Um, So I personally um, have myself overpaid for way too many experiences that fell short for me over the years. So I have increased what the investment was from last summer based on what I talked about earlier in this episode, that energetic exchange, um, I give a lot in this program, in this immersion. And so I did up the investment a little bit. The investment is on the page. It's on the application. It's there because there are some options that you could choose from. So it's all laid out there. And as I wrap up here, I want to tell you one more thing. Last year, a business a financial mentor I was working with called me out on something I'd been feeling but unable to articulate. She said to me, you are both part of and repulsed by your industry. And to be honest, it still stands. I started crying tears of truth immediately when she said that. And it's because there's so much beautiful potential and possibility in the fields of coaching, leading, teaching, healing, and other helper, guide, spiritually oriented things that make up the personal development industry. And over the years, though, it's become perverted by folks who are far better at sales and marketing than they are at their craft. And it's become a pissing contest for slick copywriting, fancy websites, webinars, funnels, social media. There's nothing wrong with those things when done with clean intentions, but too many people are in it just for the money and care less about the harmful impact they have. So the Summer Business Immersion is about bringing real, genuine, valuable impact back into style specifically in this industry, but not limited. We had some artists. We had some brick and mortar business owners last year. Um, But what this is about is evening the playing field for those who don't have the biggest budgets or marketing chops. So if that's you, I would absolutely love to help you out. And that's pretty much it, y'all. That's what I wanted to share. That was the biz chat for this month for the solo episode. That is the details about the summer business immersion. You know how and where to find the application. You can apply through June 8th. If you have any questions about it before you apply, you can send them to me. You can email hello at wildsoulmovement.com or you can find me on Instagram and send me a DM. I hope this episode was helpful for you. Share it with your fellow business-oriented friends. Talk about it. Maybe have a mastermind call about it what resonated for you, what didn't, use what works, ditch what doesn't. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. I look forward to hearing how you liked this one, and I'll talk to you soon.
And the, there's still the particular fragmentations of the brain that want to con, right, condition certain people to believe even that whether they know how to dance or not, right? And it, it keeps you locked. And the safer that you can create or environments can be created for you to just fucking let loose mm -hmm. and see what's there. Again, it's, it's the surrender and stepping into the unknown. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what this body is capable of. Totally.